Welcome to Today's Workplace, a podcast created to keep employers current on the latest employment law trends while providing proactive solutions to the everyday issues arising in today's rapidly changing workplace. Is your business prepared for today's workplace? Let's find out with your hosts, Barbara Johnson and Belinda Reed Shannon. Welcome to Today's Workplace. During our last episode in our series of discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we spoke with Kelly Dermody and Jahan Sagafi, who gave us their perspectives on diversity, equity, and inclusion as plaintiff side class action attorneys who bring systemic discrimination cases. Today, we are very excited to welcome to our show Perrine Fark a recognized authority on effective diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Perrine is an internationally recognized diversity and inclusion speaker and author of Inclusion, The Ultimate Secret to an Organization's Success. She's a TED Talk speaker who was nominated in the top 50 most influential women in UK tech and also a judge at the Diversity in Tech Awards. Perrine drove the strategy at leading organizations such as Facebook, PagerDuty, AvePoint, and for over a decade in London. She has an extensive track record of delivering groundbreaking, inspiring diversity and inclusion speaker sessions that motivate the audience to become inclusive leaders. Welcome. Welcome, Perrine. Hi, thank you for having me, Barbara Belinda. So excited to be here with you today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. We're excited to have you here. Uh, Perrine, you bring a global perspective to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so we'd really like for you to tell us about your background and how you got into diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Absolutely. And um, I have a confession to make, which is not really a confession because you can probably hear from my accent. (laughs) I have lived in three different countries. Um, As you might hear, um, I was born and bred in France uh, and then I've lived in Italy for a few years and I now live in the United Kingdom. So I have, I I guess by my experience, I've always had a high sense of cultural awareness and cultural differences, uh, which obviously helps with the, the work I do. Uh, but essentially, I started by studying law. Uh, I, I was actually studying law as I was very interested in social justice and equality. But then I decided I did not want to become a lawyer. And so instead, I started working in marketing for technology organizations um, in the United Kingdom, uh, which, as you know, as everybody knows, I think the tech technology sector is very uh, white male dominated. And so as a woman in technology, I experienced quite a lot of microaggressions and often I was the only woman in the room and at some point I was even the only mother uh, in leadership because as I grew in my career and I became um, part of the leadership team I was very often the only woman the only mother in the room which led to a lot of uh, hard difficult uh, situations so now I help employers create more inclusive and diverse environments where people and organizations can thrive And I do this through keynote sessions, like you mentioned at the start, and workshops, programs, and consulting and coaching for organizations globally. So that's that's my background and my journey regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. Karen, you've written a book called Inclusion. Tell us how you define inclusion and how it relates to the concept of belonging, two terms that we hear a lot but some of our listeners may not have given a lot of thought to what these terms really mean. It's such a great question, Barbara, because in my experience, um, I think even the term, even the terminology, diversity, equity, and inclusion can feel a little bit scary or overwhelming for a lot of people. It's, you know, it doesn't exactly roll out of the tongue, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think a lot of people are a little bit scared. In fact, there is a study that shows that I think it's about 60% of individuals uh, um, are afraid to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion for fear of saying the wrong thing. So I love your idea about breaking down the definitions and what it means. Um, And for me, inclusion is the feeling of being heard and seen and valued and respected for who we are, especially in the context of the workplace. And belonging, I think, is even stronger, is a feeling like uh, we are an important part of something greater than ourselves. So we can 
feel belonging towards a group of friends, uh, our family or community. So ultimately, in the context of the workplace, employers really want their employees to feel at the very least included, if not like they belong, but at the, at the very least included, like em their employees feel heard and seen and valued and respected, especially in the context of a meeting, for example. Employers really want em their employees to feel that they're included, they're part of the meeting, their ideas are heard and shared and, and valued, really. That's great. You also um, talk in your book, you talk about rejection and depreciation. Uh, and, you know, not a lot of um, employers in the workplace are talking about those um, aspects. And so can you explain to us what these terms mean in the DEI context and why it's important for leaders to understand them? And, and then talk to us a little bit about how they manifest in the workplace. Yeah, another great question, Melinda. One of the reasons I wanted to, to talk about these ideas of rejection and depreciation in my book was because uh, a lot of the times we understand, when we try to define a concept, we talk about the opposite. So when we ask someone, how does it feel to feel included? People answer, oh, I remember that time I felt, I felt excluded. So I really wanted to explain rejection and depreciation just as by opposition of the opposite of inclusion. And so rejection is really what we experience uh, when we're feeling denied something that we put ourselves forward for, for example. So it's the opposite of acceptance. So when an employee, for example, feels rejected after being ignored in a meeting, for example, then their sense of inclusion or belonging diminishes and they feel the opposite of included. And so this leads to lower, lower employee engagement, lower employee morale, absenteeism, and even sometimes employee turnover, where, whereby the employee just leaves the organization. So that's why I, I um, think it's important to talk about what's the opposite of inclusion, and that's often rejection or depreciation. Great. You've done a lot of work on um, diversity and inclusion in the tech space. And tell us what you found in terms of what I think you've described as startup myths in the tech sector and how these myths hold up or hold back innovation. Yeah, it's such a great question because you're absolutely right. I guess my background comes from a tech background. So I've worked with a lot of tech startups and technology organizations, which is very interesting because there is definitely some sort of, you know, ideas and concepts of what the startup founder looks like, right? Um, and so, in fact, if you do a quick Google search and you, you search startup founder, you will see images that are not necessarily representative of the entire population. So, for example, there is this myth that startup founders are young. So, you know, we, we have that idea of, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, you know, creating Facebook from his uh, dorm, you know, at uni, for example. I would actually, a lot of research demonstrate that the average age for starting a, a startup is actually 42 years old. Uh, and in fact, uh, that the, the, the most successful uh, startup founders are more actually older than that. They are 45 years old. So uh, there is a lot of academic research that demonstrates that founders in their 20s and 30s are less likely to start high growth companies. So that's, for example, a myth that completely uh, hinders innovation. Another myth is that start startup founders are men. Uh, so, you know, the first names that we think about when we think about startup founders, again, are Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, etc. But according to a 2017 crunch-based study, only 17% um, actually, um, which, which is actually true, a, lo a lot of the startup founders are, are men, uh, according to a crunch-based study. However, there are a lot of very successful startups that were led by, by, by women. Um, and in fact, uh, there is a research by All Rays that demonstrates that startups that are um, built by women tend to raise more capital. So there are a lot of um, advantages of having female founders. Um, and even, you know, there is the myth that startup founders are white. Um, you know, the current conversation around Black Lives Matter has raised a lot of um, awareness around systemic racism. And, and again, when we think about startup founders, we think about Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs, et cetera. But there are a lot of successful uh, black startup founders. So a couple of examples I share is, for example, Nana Addison, who was born in Ghana and uh, raised um, funding in Germany. And it's a tech entrepreneur who has founded uh, actually two, uh, two startups. Um, another one is someone called Gerald Manu. So Gerald Manu um, is actually from, from, from London. 
and uh, he he was he founded a startup as well uh, called uh, Devachi, which is extremely successful. Um, and so those are a couple of examples of how some sort of myth or stereotypes around startup founders are actually wrong and counterproductive, and they are also hindering innovation because if um, if investors keep funding startups uh, for the same group of people, then any innovation won't, won't have a lot of chance to thrive. So that's why with my work, I try to raise awareness about some biases um, and to really also, I work with a lot of investors to educate them around those ideas so that they found not just stereotypical startup founders, but more diverse groups of startup founders. So that that's interesting um, to understand the nuances of inclusion as it uh, plays out uh, in the tech industries and particularly the connection you made with innovation. I'm going to ask you another question about um, inclusion in the workplace and ask your observation of how it plays out in U.S.-based companies versus outside of the U.S., say in Europe or in uh, Asia, the Asia PAC region. Um, can you tell me, are there any differences or how, how does an organization that, that really um, operates in all of those, how do they approach uh, driving inclusion in the workplace where you have so many cultural differences? It's such a great question. A lot of my clients have offices all over the world, um, and a lot of them have an, might have an office in London and of, an office on the maybe on the east coast of the US, and actually even another office on the west coast of the US. And so, some of the things we talk about with them is uh, the idea of cultural awareness, because um, although we might all speak the same language, you know, English, <laughs> we might all speak the same language. Uh, we actually have some cultural differences which might then become, if they're not addressed or at least we're not aware of them, become some issues in, the com in communication. So, for example, if there are meetings with teams based in the UK and teams in the US, you know, virtual meetings, Zoom meetings, and an idea is being discussed, maybe certain cultures might be more upfront in the way they say things and share their ideas because of the culture. But some cultures, like, for example, uh, it, the, I guess in the British culture, uh, there is that sense of you know politeness, whereby a lot of the things are not being said sort of uh, in a straightforward way. Maybe it's it's maybe statements are made in a way that um, we but you know we want to be polite at all costs to the to the point of not sharing our ID in a very obvious way, and so that could lead to misunderstandings, etc. So it's very important to talk about cultural awareness and differences uh, equally. You know, if you have a team based, in, for example, in in Asia, you know, in Japan, where there is a lot of hierarchy in those countries and employees who are more in junior positions are less likely to speak up in meeting because it's just seen as plain rude. And so whereas if they might have a meeting with people in the US, maybe the US employees might not understand why some people in those Asian countries are more quiet, for example, which might lead to frustrations, etc. So it's a very good question. And the answer is that um, cultural awareness uh, sessions or cultural, cultural awareness workshops are very important to talk about what are some of the ways that each country and culture tends to communicate to, so that we better understand each other and we work better together and collab we collaborate better together. No, that's very interesting, Perrine. I'm, I'm thinking of a um, Japanese-based client where before the meeting, they all get together to work out any conflicts so that by the time they get to the meeting, everything goes smoothly because they're wow. very, very conflict adverse as opposed to being in meetings where people are kind of yelling and screaming at each other and expressing ideas. So the, the cultural awareness to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to contribute and know how to contribute and best to contribute. It's really an interesting concept. So, so thank you for, um, for raising that. You know, the sad reality is that many employees feel that their supervisors know very little about diversity and inclusion and don't really care about diversity and inclusion. What can leadership of organizations do to ensure that supervisors are engaged and in, invested in diversity and inclusion? That's another great question. And that's something I, I touched a little bit about earlier when I said um, 
research after research demonstrates that there is a real fear of saying the wrong thing. There is amongst leaderships, but even amongst professionals, there is a fear of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion to the point that it just stops the discussion altogether, which is counterproductive. So there are steps that um, uh, professionals can take to really um, start the conversation in a constructive way around diversity, equity and inclusion. So if I had to sort of summarize them, I would say the first step would be to do your research, uh, research, prepare and plan in advance. Um, you know, senior leaders, like you mentioned earlier, focus on numbers and business impact of any initiative. So they, they will look at diversity and inclusion the same way. What's going to be the business impact and the outcome? So if you do your research and you can demonstrate that there are there is going to be an, a return on investment in terms of employee retention, employee engagement, employee productivity, employee morale, then you're going to be more likely to get their attention. That's the first point. Then I'd say the second step is to set the scene and facilitate because as you start the conversation about diversity and inclusion, your employees should be aware ahead of time. They should come prepared. So if you are very clear about the goals of the conversation, what are we trying to achieve and keep the benefits top of mind, you know, why, um, why is it going to be beneficial for everybody in the company to have the discussion? That's going to be very helpful as well. So really setting the scene, explaining in advance to your people why, why we're having the conversation. And then the third step would be really to ask questions and listen more than you speak by asking questions on, on behalf of the group and really getting your audience members to ask questions. That's going to be really key. So you might open up the discussion with, you know, as a company, what are we doing to focus our efforts on building a diverse and inclusive workplace and really pause and let people speak. Um, sometimes it, it might feel uncomfortable to have some silence in the conversation, but it's actually what you want. You really want the people to come up with their own ideas. And I'd say finally, really try to define what diversity and inclusion means to your organization, because we talked about it earlier. I think the very concept of diversity and inclusion can feel overwhelming or a bit scary. And even um, certain organizations might have a slightly different take on what it means for them. So for example, for one organization, it might be we want more women. For an or other organization, it's like, it might be we want more uh, ethnic diversity. So really take the time to define what it means for your organization and what are your goals. So those are sort of, you know, four steps I would recommend to anyone who would like to start the conversation about diversity and inclusion at work. That's great. Uh, that's, that's a great checklist for companies that, that are trying to figure it out. Um, let's talk about uh, something that none of us saw coming, but uh, very relevant to the conversation. Many companies in the United States have gone to remote work during the pandemic, and many companies have not yet returned employees to the physical work place. And if they did, they're using a hybrid model. So that means that a certain form of remote working for large parts of uh, the workforce, particularly in the knowledge economy, uh, are, are going to continue to be remote. And so with that new nuance to our workplace environment, Perina, I was wondering if you could uh, talk to us about how employers can continue to grow as diverse and inclusive organizations when they have um, many more employees working remotely more often? Yeah, it's a great question because I talk, when I talk about the sort of the phenomenon you're talking about, I talk about a revolution. I think there is a revolution happening in the workplace right now. Um, you know, we've had, the, you know, the first revolution was the introduction of emails, I believe, a few years ago, a few years back. And then there's been another revolution, which was cloud adoption, you know, when cloud technologies were adopted. But that, I really think right now we're going through a third revolution, which is flexible work, hybrid work. Um, and uh, let's face it, most of uh, managers, actually, actually the majority of managers have not been trained on how to handle this new workplace, the hybrid workplace or the flexible workplace. You have employees working from home, employees in the office, employees who do both, and, and employers or managers have not been trained. So I think it's it's a, it's a revolution and, and we need to train our new generation of managers on how to handle a hybrid workforce. I mean, and there are certainly some strategies that can be used to um, to create an effective team and a, a happy team and an engaged team in, in this context. I'd say the first rule is to really over communicate. I mean, we talked about over, over communicating before, but now is the time to really 
become the chief reminder officer and really um, there is no such thing as over communicating. You, I don't think any employees could say, oh, I've heard this already three times. That's enough now. I think in remote work or flexible work, you have to repeat yourself. You know, the goals, you have to repeat the goals and repeat uh, status updates um, through all channels, whether it's Slack or emails or maybe you have a WhatsApp group um, or a Zoom call. You really need to over communicate as much as possible. The second point I would say is to review your workplace policies. And I know you, you to have a solid background in, in legal, and that's something you, you certainly be aware of. But a, a lot of workplace policies will be outdated uh, because they were based on traditional uh, in-premise uh, work and they no, no longer apply. So a lot of uh, human resource professionals will need to review their workplace policies with professionals like yourselves, possibly, but really to make sure that there is no bias. There is no bias towards in-person workers, giving them an unfair advantage. Uh, for example, uh, managers should really focus on results-based per performance um, rather than office presentism. So really spend the time to review your workplace policies. And then the third thing is to now more than ever before, you want to monitor feedback closely, uh, whether it's qualitative feedback in your one-to-one -one meetings and really listening to what your employee is saying, or even quantitative feedback through surveys and uh, pulse survey that you might send maybe monthly or quarterly. Uh, you really want to make sure your people who are at home, especially maybe they're uh, caring for children or uh, disabled family members or sick relatives, you want to make sure they're being heard equally and you, you take action. And finally, I'd say that uh, ensure fair and equitable promotion practices, because again, we know there might be a lot of bias towards promoting people who are in the office more. Uh, and the reality is a lot of remote workers simply don't have the choice. They might live in uh, a poor neighborhood and they can't afford to commute to work or they might be looking after children or relatives. You want to make sure they are promoted equally, not for being in the office, but for uh, delivering. So those are sort of four, uh, I'd say, steps or strategies I would use um, to make sure that we uh, foster inclusion and diversity uh, in this hybrid work. Yeah, Maureen, you, you just gave some um, great examples in terms of what employers can do to increase um, diversity and inclusion, especially in the um, hybrid um, workplace. Tell us about some of the mistakes that you've seen employers make. Yeah, it's a, it's a common question I get. And um, actually, the reality is there are quite a few. So for the sake of this episode, maybe I'll focus on the top three ones, most common ones, because there are, I mean, it's easy to make, make some mistakes. I think the big one big mistake I see over and over when I work with organizations is that they focus on uh, inclusive and diverse hiring, but not retention. What does that mean? That means that they might uh, work very, very hard to hire different candidates, maybe more women, more people of color, more disabled employees. But ultimately, those people come and they don't stay. Why? Because there is no system in place to uh, listen to those, uh, to those employees and, and, and retain them. So things like um, creating employee resource groups or um, you know, have, having more feedback session or um, employee feedbacks, etc., could really help. So I think really focusing on retention, not just hiring. The second mistake I see often is that organizations leave their corporate mission statement out. Again, what does that mean? Well, it means that if you're really serious and committed to diversity and inclusion, you should really revisit your mission statement, your corporate mission statement. That doesn't have to be a three-month project. It, it can simply be looking at your mission statement on your website and, and get together with your leadership team and think about how can we make sure we incorporate that we really believe in diversity and inclusion. Make it part of your vision because that's going to drive ultimately all your efforts as well. And the third big mistake I see as well organizations do is um, failing to get leadership commitment. Not getting CEO commitment on diversity and inclusion is probably the biggest mistake of all because it means that there will be no uh, financial support or um, authority or influence to drive the project. So that means that whoever is leading the diversity and inclusion initiative is going to get stuck at some point very quickly because they're going to have no uh, power, authority, influence or budget to drive um, things forward. So make sure that you get um, senior leadership commitment 
um, to support your diversity and inclusion initiative is very important. That's great. Uh, lots of w great and wonderful advice. Um, and, you know, you've given us the benefit of your insight from working across a, a bunch of different industries and and um, different companies, uh, Perrine. So I'd like you to um, kind of uh, round us out with the top three, uh, I guess, points of, of, of guidance that you can provide organizations. Give me what are the most impactful three for an organization that is really trying to um, not only uh, create an inclusive workforce, but sustain it. Yeah, so if whoever, who, whoever is listening to us and wants to sustain diversity and inclusion, I would say the first advice I would give you, whether you are in senior leadership or an individual contributor, I would say, be an advocate or an upstander. Uh, there is a lot of research that shows that um, people think that someone else will will uh, drive diversity and inclusion, but you have to, th if you think of yourself as an upstander, as an advocate, uh, as intimidating as it might be, it's going to be critical to change your mindset. So becoming a more vocal advocate of inequalities at work or other colleagues is going to really help you. So think of yourself as an upstander, as an advocate, and that's going to really help you drive things forward. The second advice I would give is to uh, be a tireless student. Um, continue to learn um, as much as you can about um, different people who are different from you, different gender, different ethnic background, different ability, different age. Think of yourself as a, as a lifelong learner. You might read books, you might listen to podcasts, you might listen to audiobooks or join communities near where you live. But the more you can be with people who are different from you, the more you will learn and open your, your mind. And the third advice I would give is to fight unconscious bias and stereotypes and microaggressions. Um, when you notice uh, harassment or discrimination or, or bias at work, um, you want to take action. And it might be well-intentioned because in fact, most of the time microaggressions are actually well-intentioned. But if you can see that the, the recipient uh, is upset in any way, um, you should be an upstander and take action. So again, the three advices here I would give is be an advocate, uh, be a student, and fight unconscious bias and microaggression. Thank you. What great advice and what a wonderful conversation. Thank you for joining us. If our listeners would like to learn more about Perrine's work and how to contact her, they can find information on today's workplacepodcast.com. And thank you again, Perrine. Thank you, Barbara and Belinda. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've been listening to Today's Workplace with Barbara Johnson and Belinda Reach. If you like what you heard, click subscribe so you don't miss out on future updates and episodes. For more information about today's episode, check out todaysworkplace.com. That's T-O-D-A-Y-S-W-O-R-K-P-L-A-C-E.com.